All right guys, something a little bit different uh, this week as far as the video topic. Uh, may not be of interest to everybody, but I personally found it fascinating. So I wanted to share. Uh, my taxidermist, Brian, who's also a really good buddy of mine, called and asked if I'd have interest in filming the entire process of a mount, this buck behind me. Naturally, I jumped on the opportunity and I'd seen bits and pieces of the process before. Obviously, Brian's done a number of my mounts, but I'd never watched it start to finish. And I think the thing that stuck out to me, or at least was the most fascinating to me, was his appreciation of the white-tailed deer in general and uh, you know, trying to replicate everything as real world, real life as possible. Um, I think all that shines through as you watch this and watch him talk through the things. Uh, it was truly watching a master at his craft. He's super talented. Taxidermy's, you know, very much an art form. And so it was very cool to see it, this entire process. We don't always think about what goes in to a high quality mount. So hopefully you guys find it uh, as interesting as I did. This, that's what's cool about this form. It's everything, when it's on the form, and nothing looks like it's huge or anything, but like once that skin gets on here, this deer is, this deer is big. He's really big. It basically helps this cape slide on and then it locks it into place too. So from the time a deer dies and its heart stops beating, it literally starts to rot at that exact minute. So the faster you can get your pictures taken, get it loaded up, the better because that bacteria starts to grow and anywhere from 50 degrees up, it starts to grow exponentially so you can really get into big problems. With your deer here, Jared, you got them in the morning, it was chilly, and you had all your business taken care of, had them over to my shop um, in four hours, roughly four hours, which is really fast and it's really good. But you can already see, even on this hide, on this back area here, this, this, is, this is some blood damage, but it's also some tissue damage that happens in that short of a time. On a, on a cape. Um, it wasn't enough to where there's any slipping or any issues like that, but a few more hours or some more time, or if it sits folded up, you could actually run into some problems with that. And the first thing you see when this skin starts to rot like this is the hair on this side will start to fall out just because there's nothing there to grab it anymore. And that's what they call slipping in the taxidermy industry. And it's the biggest enemy that we have. So, but this went through a beautiful tan um, everything held together. That's the other key to good taxidermy is a good high quality tan. Um, I go to professionals um, that take care of it all for me because it's a lot of work and it's a lot of effort and a lot of really harsh chemicals to make it happen. So there are shortcuts that you can take with tanning and I don't suggest that at all, especially uh, for the longevity of amount. When this thing's done, it'll look the same 30 years from now as it does today. And that's because of a high quality tan that basically turns us into like white baseball leather and thin. So I got all the ear cartilage pulled out of the ears and now we're just gonna use this ear liner that was molded and cast from an actual deer ear to go right in here so we get the exact shape that it took before other shortcuts that some people take is instead of using these high quality ear liners they'll actually shove auto filler like bondo in here and try to shape it themselves and that is uh not the not the best way to go if you want it, you know realism um, some people can do it but it's it's not it's not worth the time and effort to do that so we get his ear put in here so it takes on the shape and do the other one And this starts wet. So this is a wet tan. So it starts pliable and wet, and then it'll dry hard. And that's how we're able to move all the skin. And I'll talk about it a bunch during the mounting process. Another thing that I work with people on is if you look at any animal, deer, your dog, that's the best example I tell taxidermists is look at your dog. If you look at your dog or your cat, 
all their hair patterns are in a place. Like everything on them flows and moves with the muscles of their body. So if you're doing your deer mount and something looks out of place or the hair is kind of going this way or it's cockeyed, it means that you need to groom it better because all these hairs have a specific place they need to go. So now I'm just pulling the skin on, getting it in the rough, the rough general area. The whole key to taxidermy is moving the skin to where it needs to be. And that just takes, takes a little bit of time. Because it makes a difference when you go to set them. comes up like this and then it takes a complete turn back which is not not normal I mean it's not overly um, rare but it's also it's not the norm as far as rack sets I set all my racks based on photographs harvest photographs because every deer's rack sits different so when I have a hunter bring me something in I, I look at their harvest pictures and their photos, their trail cameras, and I set the rack to that exact angle, um, which is just one of those other details that, uh, it, in my opinion, is very necessary to make a, a realistic amount. So this one we're gonna have rotated. So I got some clay back there and I'm gonna set this eye. And the most important thing that we're going to do here is a deer's pupil, whether it's heads up, it's heads down, is going to be parallel to the ground that he's on. So even if a deer has his head down and he's drinking water, that those pupils are going to be still parallel to the wherever ground that he's standing on. So I have to check that out, find the pupil, and then make sure that it's parallel with the ground. And I, I even go a little bit extreme on that to where I'll actually set a level on it and make sure that that pupil is indeed level. And it is. Crucial. So this is gonna be cool because he's gonna have some eye rotation. So now you use basically three pieces of clay is all. Um, everybody sets their eyes different. You can go on YouTube or whatever and look at a million taxidermy things. They're all different. This is this is the way I do it because it's uh, it works. And I've been judged by judges all over the U.S. on my eye set, and uh, it's one of the parts that I that I score really well on. So I figured that if this is the way I'm doing it, and I and the judges like it, I'm not going to change. And it's relatively simple. The taxidermy is all about muscle memory. It's knowing how hard to push, how hard not to push. Um, and that only can come from time and experience. You can't just decide one day that you're going to be a taxidermist and have deer look good. Um, it just does not work that way. You're going to always going to have a crease in your car uncle right here. Your highest part of your eye is always going to be the front third. Your lowest part of your eye is always going to be the bottom middle. And it takes a slight, a slight curve down like this. And then your pupil is always in the middle and level. So those, those couple little simple, simple things to follow make a ton of difference. And, and now you can see that we're gonna have all kinds of skin to move, which is what we do. Just sticking his ears in here. Cause there's gonna be, there's a place for all this skin to go. You just have to figure it out.
and find it. And that's where the that's where the hair patterns and everything comes into place. So once you get it assembled, then you start to you start to figure out what goes where. And it's not too overly complicated because you got an eye hole, so your eye better be right there. <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You got nose holes. The nose hole needs to go where the nose holes are. Um, and then the rest of the skin, once you get your anchor points down, the rest of the skin goes where you taxi it to make it look how it's supposed to look. His, this, this guy's nose was uh, abnormally large. So I couldn't even use one of my nose casts because I don't have a nose cast that's big enough. So basically I'm just taking some skin and I'm gonna taxi it and work it down towards his chest and armpits to get all wrinkles out and have everything kind of flow naturally. The key to a brisket is every deer has its brisket and some here, some have this rosette here, which is a good or easy reference point. Some don't, but most of them do have this little rosette. That's, you can take that as a reference point and you're going to put that right in the middle of the, of the top of his brisket in order to get things to line up. And then for his armpits, if you look at your trail camera pictures or your videos, you're going to notice every single time that the hair patterns where his armpits are go right there in the crease of his, of his armpit. That's how you know things are in the right spot. And the same with your, the middle of the brisket. See how it kind of mohawks up on his brisket? Well, that obviously has to be dead center on the, on the part of the form. So I do the very pop top part here. Then I line up my bottom lip. And then this is a little trick that I learned from Joe Meter. You get this, you know this goes here, and you know this is here. So I'll take this and I'll make a little crease. And that's the exact corner. Well then, this is the exact corner of his mouth. So nice and simple, you need to take that crease, start there. So now I'm gonna go through, and I'm gonna tuck my lip right into the form. I cut a very, very, very tight lip slot. Some guys will go in there with a Dremel and really put it out there so it's easy to tuck. The problem with that is, is if it's easy to tuck, it's easy for it to come back out. I, put a, I make a very tight lip slot so I make that foam work for me. So once that lip is pushed in here and I already have the skin paper thin, the uh, foam pinches it together for me and holds it into place versus having a big trough that I could just easily just throw it in there. Another thing you see a lot is way too much bottom lip showing. I see it's crazy the number of deer mounts that you'll see and it looks like they got a chew in. Um, it, for the most part, a lot of deer, you actually don't see any bottom lip. I have most of my reference pictures actually show very little to no bottom lip, um, but you just want to show just a little bit. Um, and I'll show you one of my, a couple of my favorite reference pictures. Our uncle, which is the very front corner. And I stick that where I want it. And then I take my little tucking tool, which I made. And I have just a tiny, tiny little bit of eye skin paper thin and I take that little paper thin piece of skin and I tuck it behind the clay that I sculpted and then I'll put my tear duct in everything has a place it may not go line up right where you want it to so that means you have to taxi the skin but everything has a place where it's supposed to go and if it's in the right spot it's gonna go there The finish work is what I like the best. Right. 
So now I'm just taking the, my brush and I'm softly pushing that back up under that skin so everything's nice and smooth. And then since he's still wet, I don't mess with it a whole lot until the skin sets up just a little bit. But all I'm really take, paying attention to right now is that I'm tucked in, I have my front corner, I have my eye shape, and then my eyelashes are where they need to be. His bottom lashes come out here, his top lashes are here, going roughly at a 45 degree angle down, and then now I kind of get away from it a little bit until I get it, until the skin sets up a little bit. You don't want to make too wide of stitches. Um, you want your t stitches to be tight. You want your stitches to be precise. Um, otherwise, things will pull, move on you. Especially when you're taxiing that skin around and you're pulling on these stitches. So you want to take your time and do it the right way. And now my job is to taxi skin until my wrinkles go away. And that just, you just gotta push, pull, go this way, go that way, until that skin falls into where it needs to be. And it has a place to go. Like it, it, it has somewhere to be. You just have to be patient and get it there. And we're gonna have a little bit of wrinkles here for the way that he turns. But before I actually put those in, we need to have the skin straight and put them in at the exact angle that they need to, to go in at. So this is where the brush is your best friend. So if you think about a deer, and you think about deer mounts when you look at them, the hair should all be pointing down because basically with the entire coat and cape of a deer is, their entire hide is like a watershed. So it they, they needs a place for when the rain comes and the snow, snow comes on them that it can actually filter and go down. So when you're grooming your deer, you want to groom it down to the ground like if he was, if he was literally getting showered on with water, the, the way that the water would be flowing off of him. And as we, as we come through here, you can see this, the, the hair that's pointed back. So like if you look here, how this hair is pointed back here because the way that we pulled the cape on, that's completely wrong. They can't do that. So what you need to do is come through and we'll, and we'll train that hair and we'll actually bit, get it to go down like the watershed that it needs to be. The same thing happens on the face. So when we, when we put the mount together, you can see his hair, it's kind of going this way, that way. The face is exactly the same too. That hair needs to come straight down. And then once you do that, you can see the skin and the hair patterns kind of start to match up and go with each other and look more natural than they did before. That around his muzzle, that hair actually comes around the curve of his mouth and down, straight down like that how those hair patterns and the lips and everything are just right where they need to be. Is if you look at him head on and from the side, these ears, none of this, none of the ears, any of that skin is where it needs to be. It's all out of place on both ears. This hair's coming out of here. There's a wrinkle here. Um, same over here. That, those hair patterns show you that none of that skin on the ears is where it's supposed to be. So we gotta go in there and fix that. See how the white hair is inside? It's inside of the, of the crease of his ear and it actually is in there. Well, the reason all that's in there is to keep bugs out and to keep things out of his ear. So if you look at our mount, all that's out and it's out of place. So we have to taxi that skin so that inside crease is on the edge of the ear. So we take it and move our skin in there and get all that hair placed inside of the ear. And we have that edge. And if you look at it now from the front, 
it already looks completely different. So with that now we can really start to fine tune our grooming and get the hair patterns right where they need to be and you start getting that muscle definition in the ear butt. It's just amazing what running a brush through that hair will do to really clean it up. Lots of grooming. But if you think about it, even deer, um, between what they do for themselves and what they do for each other, so how many times mm -hmm. you sit there and see two deer grooming each other? It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Like they spend a lot of time getting that, doing this kind of stuff. Makes a big difference. So if you look at this deer's head right now, we have his nose in the right spot. We have the this part begroomed. We have his eyes shaped to where we want it. But if you look up here, that's still messed up. That's not how a deer's brow goes. Because basically there's a big muscle here and a muscle here that helps him control what he's doing. So that hair has to be groomed now. And it and how you now if you watch it from being messed up until where it needs to be you can see that everything is going to fall into place and actually look correct and it looks and it'll look like your trail camera pictures that you look at every day and now we'll do the other side so it's almost like a part that splits in the middle of a human's hair and it kind of rides you can see it kind of goes and it rides that muscle right above the eye And now things look more, more in place. So if you look at some of your other deer mounts and if you look at pictures of deer, what you'll see is these, these whiskers that he has right above his eye. And see right now how they're pointed up and to the back? Well, those are in the completely wrong spot. The entire reason that these, these whiskers exist on a deer is so he doesn't poke his eye out with a stick when he's walking through the timber. So we have to move and taxi these um, whiskers down on his eye so they go forward and out. So that way now when he's walking through the timber, he'll feel that on, his, um, on these whiskers and shut his eye before he pokes his eye out with a stick. And that's, that's really cool. Another really neat thing about these animals is everything on this deer is here for a reason. All right. So this is about all we can do for the first day. Um, I'm gonna let the, the skin set up a little bit, the glue uh, take hold, do a little bit of grooming, and then after that, he's gonna sit for um, the next week. And then after that, he, and after the skin's dry, we'll go and we'll do the epoxy work and the painting and the nose finishing, and he'll be ready for the wall. We have to fill that with epoxy, and then we have to sculpt in the nictitating membrane on both sides um, there's just a little bit of skin uh, skin junction here that we'll put a small amount of epoxy in before painting on either side of the nose we'll put a very small amount of epoxy here and then actually and then after that we're ready for painting so what we'll notice is with this picture here this is going to be his left eye and since the white of his eye is in the front that's how we'll according that's how we'll sculpt in the nictitating membrane so you're going to have more of the nictitating membrane in the front where where his eye is rotated than you would on our other eye which is this eye where the white's in the back of his other eye the nictitating membrane is substantially smaller on that side so when you have a deer with eye rotation the nictating membranes are never going to be the same size. A tiny amount on the tear ducts, but for the most part the tear ducts are just straight hair to hair. Just put just the smallest amount of epoxy in there. Let me just use minimal, minimal material. So this is the eye that we were just talking about, where the, where the white is in the back. So our nictitating membrane is going to be smaller. 
So we'll take a bead or a little worm of epoxy sculpt and then we'll take that worm and we'll fill in that small gap between the glass and the skin. I use flesh colored because that skin that's going to be between his eyeball and um, the inside of the eye is going to be somewhat of a flesh tone because it's inside um, there. So then I just clean off the excess so it's a very, very small amount of actual material that goes in there. Once the amount, when I put the initial first amount on it versus what actually goes in there after I clean it all off, it's such a tiny, tiny amount of actual material. And then I'll, with my tool and the epoxy sculpt, I'm gonna sculpt that in. And this, like we talked about before, is definitely a muscle memory thing. How much to use, how hard to push, all that stuff. And we really won't see what we get until this is painted because that's gonna, this piece right there that I'm sculpting, that's gonna be black like the picture was. So I'm slicing those sharp to give that nictating membrane its shape, just like in the pictures. So when we paint this deer, we're gonna use five colors. We're gonna start with a flesh colored, and then move on to a Mars red color, and then come in with a blending brown and burnt umber type color, and then uh, finish off with a darker blending brown color to uh, give us the look that we're looking for and to give it some transparency. Super important, especially on the nose. So you're basically just making sure that you're starting off with a, a medium that's gonna accept the paint. And with the inner ears. is a flesh pink type tone that we're gonna use on the inner ears we're going to use on the eye skin as our base coat. We're going to use on the inner nose and we're going to use on the bottom third of his nose pad. There you go. So the little lines in between there are going to show some flesh tone. And then lastly, we're just going to put some of that um, flesh color inside of his ear. It's not going to be bright pink inside of there, because it never is. We're going to, we're going to tone it down with uh, some blending brown, because the deer's ear is never just perfectly pink inside. Now we're going to do the top and bottom of the eyelids and the nictating membrane.
with a darker brown. And then we're going to come back after that with a layer of red. The key to layering these colors is, try, is trying to get the exact one you look at. You know, you don't want, just want to paint it brown. You want to paint, you want to get to that brownish color by utilizing mixing of other hues. So I'm just doing the very bottom lid and the nictating membrane now. Do that on both sides. So some of that flesh epoxy is still going to show through. Now you can kind of see how we sculpted that membrane. So now we're going with an almost bright red color around his eye skin. kind of adds in there. Now we turned our pink to almost a reddish color. And these layers are very, very thin. I, I don't know exactly how it's going to translate on the camera, but um, the amount of paint that we're putting on here is not very much paint at all. So next thing we're going to do is come in on that red and we're going to come with a chocolate brown and burnt umber type color and put a small layer on there on top of our red. It seems really subtle, but it's just a tiny, tiny layer. Do it on the other side. Flesh colored, the Mars red, the chocolate brown and the burnt umber. Now we're gonna come through with a blending brown at the very end, just a very light coating to bring it all together. And then, then that's it. So it's just a, a spritz to put one little layer on top of there. And then that's it. You'll see now, once we brush it out, you'll see that, that depth of that color come to life. So the eye skin is done. No skin, or the nose skin is the last thing we have to do. And then we brush it off and do the nose texturing. And we got a finished deer. Nose skin is a color that's called Yox Nose Pad Gray. So a deer's nose, after I paint it, we'll do some stuff on a deer's nose. But if everybody thinks a deer's nose is black, a deer's nose is definitely not black. It's an it's a array of colors, and that's where I've come up with um, to use this blend, is, it, is it's a mix of other colors that actually has some transparency, and you're able to see when you can look at it with a flashlight. And I just put a relatively light coat on there, because then we're gonna come through with our nose texturing material, and that has some of that color mixed into it also. So now I'm barely going on here, and I'm not sure if you can fully see it, but you can see that those flesh tones coming through the darkness there. So this is a macro shot of a deer's nose. And what you see here is you can see the, the separation of the, of the lines or of the little fingerprints in there. And then you can also see the flesh tones that are just barely underneath those. And you can definitely notice on that that there's not, that nose is not black go through and get all this and once you start brushing it off you can see how much overspray actually took place so we can come over here and see that all that is is hair that we just spray painted over so now it brings it all back and you see it starts to look a lot more natural you get that spray off the eyelashes not here. Brush it all off of there. And then that skin color really starts to come through. And then we'll have to come through and get the uh, paint off the eyeball. And get that nictating membrane painted. 
and we'll get the main main paint off with a with our brush here. And you can start to see the nictating membrane that we sculpted in. Just like the picture we looked at. So I'm just going through with a straight straight blade and taking that right up to the edge. And getting that cleaned off all the way around. So it's right up to the edge of the eye. And as long as you have a brand new blade, you're not going to scratch the eyeball. As long as I know that the horns are set correctly, that's really all I care about. So I'm just coloring these the color they need to be. So if you notice the lines, all the little lines that are, are separating the nodules of the nose pad. So that's basically like a human's fingerprint. They're all different, they're all their own size. And it's important that when you try to reproduce that, that you try to reproduce the same shape as all of those while having the separation of the lines. So it actually gives that deer a signature and an identity of his own versus just putting a bunch of random bumps on it and then covering it with a coat of gloss. Um, each one of these deer noses is unique, so it's important to try to re replicate each one of those nodules as close as you can. Because you don't want them to run together. I'll do one here, then I'll move over a little bit and I'll do one here and I'll kind of space them out until they have a little bit of time to dry so they don't bleed together. And then I'll come back in and I'll just start filling those in. So doing this nose is like a four step process. So you'll do 20, 30 spots you'll give it 15 minutes. You'll do another 20, 30, you give it 15 minutes. So that way nothing molds together and then you get a really unique looking deer nose instead of something that just has a bunch of bumps on it. And I squeeze and kind of move, move the, the tip to, to replicate that shape while staying inside the lines and giving it some depth. So I just randomly go around the deer, picking out the big shapes that I can see and being able to use that, this tool to uh, get that. And I'll just space them just so I'm not running into each other. And then when I feel like I've got enough done to where I'm going to start running into each into other lines, then I'll stop and let it, these set up for a little bit before starting a new batch. But this sets up relatively quickly. You're basically just following the shape. But this part, this part you can't hurry. Otherwise they're all gonna bleed together and it's not gonna look right. Professional cameraman. Yep, just like that. And it's one of those things too where you do five or six hundred of them and it's pretty easy but when you're first starting to do it it's like it's pretty awkward yeah i can see how you gotta do it in so many different stages oh yeah because otherwise it all bleeds to into each other you can see the nose come through mm -hmm. And with that septum detail and everything, it makes a big difference. So you just finish those last few nodules up, everything else is good to go, and uh, he'll be ready for the wall.